four teachers are currently employed to educate Argentine public schools' 75 young minds. But come Tuesday, and that number will drop to three. It's um, a big shock to everybody because we only just found out in this newsletter yesterday. If we lose this teacher, our children are going to be disadvantaged enormously. Parents and students today picketed the school. Parents say the loss of any teacher would result in the school amalgamating years one to four into a single class. My son will struggle very, very deeply, like he can't handle it as it is. When we lose this teacher, the next step is to close the school. I think it's terrible, it's really disgusting. Students aren't too happy about it either. Well, it's not very good, is it? Because why should we lose a teacher just because a few kids left? I think it'll be hard losing one of our teachers and and I don't want to lose any because they're great teachers. According to the Department of Education, the school simply doesn't have the numbers to retain all four teachers after losing five students last year. A department spokesperson today said staffing allocation to all our schools is determined by a statewide formula which has been agreed upon by the Teachers Federation. We have to apply that formula to be fair to all our students that's what the situation is. Madeline Bond, NBN News. It was a grey day at Redhead, but the colour of money made sure this carnival was always going to be well attended. It did bring everybody out of the woodwork. There's uh, blokes who haven't paddled boards and skis for 15 years. I think they're, they're jumping on just hoping for a wave. And they were hard to come by in a messy swell. Carl Henderson from Sydney Club Freshwater really had to work for the $700 first prize in the ski final, holding out the fast-finishing Blair Brothers from Swansea, Belmont. The money always helps, but I was more worried about putting my ski on the rocks. It was close in the board final too, with Redhead's Tim Foran making sure Swansea Belmont had to settle for second and third yet again. It's a good opportunity to have a, a strong field and a, a hit out because I mean, it's coming towards the end of the season. Branch State and Australian titles to come. And the Hunter has plenty to look forward to with teenagers pushing the more seasoned surf campaigners. 17-year-old James Taylor continued Redhead's success in the surf swim final, while in the women's board, it was a level-headed 15-year-old to win the cash. I was pretty relaxed and that's how like, I like to race. Like Usually if I'm not relaxed, I don't go too well. Fingal Beach will host the Hunter Branch Championships in two weeks' time.
The Hunter Coalfields Flora and Fauna Advisory Committee was meant to be set up by the Director General of the Planning Department in 2005. It was included in the consent conditions for a controversial extension to the Mount Owen mine north of Singleton. But three years on and the committee still doesn't exist. The fact that that committee has not been established shows that the New South Wales Government really doesn't intend to protect our Australian native plants and animals in the Hunter Valley. Upper Hunter MP George Souris is campaigning for a permanent environmental protection agency office to be set up in the area. He says the state government has no excuse and the delay with the Flora and Fauna Committee is symptomatic of the government's constant failure to monitor, investigate and prosecute failures in consent conditions. But Minister for the Hunter, Michael Costa, says the region's mining industry is already under tough scrutiny. You don't approve uh, any coal-related facilities or any change to environmental conditions without going through a strict process. Um, whether um, the committee has the same name as was uh, suggested a number of years ago, it doesn't mean the process hasn't been undertaken. A spokesman for Extrata Coal says the Mount Owen mine is being monitored by an existing community consultative committee. Penny Evans, NBN News. It's challenge enough to stay upright on two legs, but Scott Reardon does so with one and does it well. Last year's state titles I won tricks, so against the able-bodied people say so, uh, they didn't like it, but I did. The Tamora teenager lost his lower right leg in a farming accident in 2002. Today he set a new personal best in slalom water skiing and almost broke the national disability record. Hopefully if I pull my finger out and have a go I might get close to a couple of world records. It was a tournament riddled with rain but it didn't trouble Port Macquarie's Jason Stone. An impressive final run though wouldn't be enough to stop Ellie Barner's Chris Coburn from taking the state slalom title. I had a, a bit of a buffer from yesterday which kind of got me through. His uncle Bruce won the over 45s adding another state title to his countless collection. Four days, three fatal collisions. The latest this morning, just before six on the Golden Highway. According to Singleton Police, the beige Ford Fairmont was pulling out of Broke Road onto the Golden Highway when it crossed into the path of a small Mitsubishi truck. The impact rolled the truck and spread parts of both vehicles across the highway, closing off the road to traffic. The driver of the truck was thrown from the cab and died at the scene. He was a 48-year-old New Zealander who'd been working in the Hunter. The 20-year-old driver of the sedan was uninjured. According to police, it's not a particularly dangerous intersection, but the wet weather conditions may have hampered visibility. The collision only adds to a horror stretch on our roads. On Friday, a 78-year-old woman died after a two-car accident at Lambton, while that night well-known harness racing couple Peter and Cheryl Lowe were killed in a head-on collision at Maitland. Three people are still being treated in the John Hunter Hospital following a three-car pile-up on John Renshaw Drive near Curry Curry yesterday. Jane Goldsmith, NBN News. There were smiles aplenty at Maitland sale yards today. As the rain poured down, the prices firmed and buyers and sellers alike compared rain gauges. They couldn't ask for better seasonal conditions, even if the cattle price could be sweeter. Never seen at this time of the year, never. 
I've lived there for the uh, best part of 60 years and never seen it like this. It's unreal. This is just beautiful pasture weather to get the winter really going and uh, things haven't looked brighter for about seven or eight years, I don't think. The rain has been widespread across the Hunter and is expected to hang around for a few days yet. More than 30 millimetres fell at Maitland and Cessnock today, while Williamtown is getting close to exceeding its monthly average only four days into February. We've had 88 millimetres uh, so far this month and we'll likely get similar figures over the next day or so as this upper trough system moves across. The Bureau is keeping a close eye on local river levels with some minor flooding already occurring in low-lying areas. We're just going to have to be very careful how much rain we get over the next 24 hours. Penny Evans, NBN News. A hospital has stood on this site opposite Newcastle Beach since 1817, but in about two and a half years, Mervac hopes to transform the prime beachfront land into something like this. The familiar red brick building will be replaced with a modern design incorporating concrete render, sandstone and glass. Today, Mervac released its designs for the first stage of the $320 million development after lodging them with the Department of Planning. The plans that we've submitted include uh, 146 residential apartments uh, ranging from studios through to penthouses. There's also an extensive public domain area. Phase one also includes a luxury 89-suite hotel and retail space. The Mervac plans went on public exhibition today. They'll be available from Newcastle City Council, the Department of Planning office in Honeysuckle and the department's website until March 4. The community are welcome to come and view the plans and uh, make any written submission uh, that they wish. Demolition crews have already moved in and the asbestos has been removed. The excavator is slowly chewing through the old hospital, demolishing it floor by floor, leaving piles of scrap metal in its wake. Jane Goldsmith, NBN News. It's just like going to the doctor, but he comes to you. A quick blood test and then in goes a microchip to register Huey's flu-free status. The last known case of equine influenza in the Hunter was in December and it's hoped the Purple Zone's tough restrictions will ensure there won't be any further outbreaks. We'll cross our fingers and hope we don't get a further outbreak. And um, as I say, you know, mid-March, late March, that's what they're saying and even if they're a little bit off, you know, they're a little bit optimistic. I think the end is in sight. Dr Bob Hunter averages more than 20 of these tests a day and while he says horse owners might not like the extra vet bill, it's a lot cheaper than Australia battling equine influenza in the long term and there could even be an upside to microchipping. It's probably advantageous to a lot of um, breed societies and, 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 and eventing uh, organisations because they won't have to worry about describing horses as much. So I guess there's probably a, a bit of um, silver lining in all this too. Meantime, servicing figures for the thoroughbred breeding season are down 12% in New South Wales due to the horse flu crisis. However, the stud book won't really be able to judge the virus's impact on fertility levels until foals are on the ground this spring. Penny Evans, NBN News.
The Coburn name is synonymous with water skiing and racing in their own backyard, Chris and Bruce were always going to be hard to beat. Despite the less than ideal conditions, Drew Ireland, Elise and Tim Bradstreet not only claimed their divisions, but also set personal best distances in the jump. Still on the water and Central Coast crews have dominated round seven of the local surfboat series held at Caves Beach. McMaster's was the most impressive club, finishing first in five divisions on the day, including a 1-2 result in the Open Women's. In the Open Men's, the McMaster's crew was forced to share top spot with Pacific Palms. Newcastle crews, Dixon Park and Nobbies rounding out the minor placings. Avoca then proved too strong in the men's Masters division. Finally to sailing and skipper Gary Brunnages and his boat YB Flat have claimed the most lucrative prize for skiff racing in Australia, the National 16-foot Sprint Championship. 50 boats lined up on Lake Macquarie for a shot at the title and after the early knockout rounds, four boats from Belmont and four from Sydney had earned a place in the final. YB Flat and the Danny Anderson skippered OAS made it a winning double for the Belmont Club, with defending champion Clint Bowen from Manly claiming third spot in his boat, Fluid Building. Mitchell Hughes, NBN News. The 25-year vision aims to reinvigorate the CBD, including creating an education precinct and protecting the East End's heritage values. Newcastle MP Jodie McKay hopes a 90-metre building height limit in the West End will stimulate development in the dilapidated suburb. Those taller buildings are certainly what a lot of those developers have been after and uh, and I think that you know in, t in 10, 15 years' time we'll see that as the new um, administrative heart of our city. Public consultation led to some changes, including lower building heights near the Civic Precinct, Cooks Hill and Hamilton South, and allowing above-ground parking. Penny Evans, NBN News. Concreting, brick laying, all of those are affected by the rain, and also, um, you know, sometimes there's a delay where they're waiting for the uh, the ground to dry out. So it certainly has a, had a, an effect. Knock-off time at the Steelworks meant big business for the small neighbourhood pubs and clubs of Newcastle, and the Ties Hill Social Club was one of the most popular. 
four o'clock of an afternoon when the BHB used to close, they used to come and have their drinks here and then they'd have their functions here and Christmas parties and bucks night, you name it, they had it. But with the BHP long gone and competition from the mega clubs, the Elizabeth Street watering hole closed last year and today everything from the grand piano to the salt and pepper shakers was up for sale. Joan Gilshannon and Aileen Monk clocked up nearly 30 years in the kitchen between them. They came back today for one last look. But we'll never forget it the way it was. It was a wonderful place to come to. The site will be auctioned later in the month. Just another small neighbourhood club whose number was up. Paul Lobb, NBN News. Having missed out on a place in the Socceroos side to face Qatar, Stuart Mashalik, Adam Depuzzo, Mark Bridge and James Holland had little time to ask why. Back in training with the Jets this afternoon. Joel Griffiths is also home, but this was a sight no Newcastle fan wanted to see. The A-League's most dominant player went straight from the tarmac to the physio table before being taken to a specialist for further tests on his injured hamstring. His twin brother is also in some doubt. Adam Griffiths is still suffering a little bit with his cork, which is uh, not good news. Those injuries and a long-range forecast of wet weather could cause plenty of selection headaches for Gary Van Egmond. Oh, look, it may change as far as personnel is concerned. Some players, you know, uh, a little bit better in the, in the dry than, than in the wet. As the team continues preparations for the all-important clash with the Mariners, management is also busy preparing for next season. The Jets have officially tabled an offer to Sydney FC midfielder Ruben Zadkovic and are also looking to retain several of their own young stars, including Mushalik, Depuzzo, Andrew Durante and Tarek Elrich. No, you have to keep planning. You have to keep on looking to see what you can and can't have. Mitchell Hughes, NBN News. Three, two, one. Smile, everybody. Not the most camera-shy class of 2008. Some of the biggest names in the movie business are jostling for lens time as the Oscars party season kicks off with lunch. It's an interest rate prediction no one wants to hear. It's possible that the variable mortgage rate, which is, has either already gone up or is about to go up in the very near future as a consequence of what the Reserve Bank did yesterday, it's possible this will happen again. 
at least once and maybe twice. Westpac's chief economist made the dire forecast in Newcastle today while giving a group of 140 investors a market outlook for 2008. And there's more bad news with Dr Caton saying a drop in interest rates is unlikely anytime soon. It's also a worrying time for those with money tied up in shares following the recent volatility in the market. And the reason for that is that there's this big question hanging over the United States economy. Is it falling into recession? And if it is, is it going to be a mild recession or a, or a deep recession? So where should mum and dad investors be placing their money, at least for the immediate future? There are some very attractive um, cash products out there that, uh, that pay an interest rate of more than 7%, for example. Madeleine Bond, NBN News. We fundamentally got two problems. There was a cost overrun in what you might call a conservation aspect of the wall and there's another cost overrun because the foundations under the wall weren't complying with the plans that we had. The CSIRO is forging ahead with developing its clean coal technologies at the Mayfield Energy Centre, despite the US government pulling out of the world's largest project citing budget blowouts. The Australian government and several local mining companies had contributed millions of dollars to the FutureGen project that was developing a clean coal power plant in America. Their agenda was more adventurous than the projects that are being planned and operated in Australia and uh, we think that uh, our work will continue in the Australian and the international context. With its first pilot plant being constructed in Victoria at the moment and another to be developed at Munmora Power Station later this year, the CSIRO says clean coal is far from dead. Because coal is uh, an affordable and widely distributed resource, uh, people will look at ways of making it environmentally clean and still economically affordable. But Hunter Anti-Mining Group Rising Tide says it's an outrageous waste of public money. We can't wait 10, 20, 30 years to see if, if you know, carbon sequestration or so-called clean coal technology turns out to be viable. We need to actually start making reductions in greenhouse gases now. Penny Evans, NBN News. As well as coal, open cut mining produces huge amounts of noise and dust and mining companies need to keep tabs on how much of those pollutants are released into the air. Developed in conjunction with Tease and Extrata, Newcastle firm Advertech has put complex environmental sensors and a weather station into the one solar-powered unit, which gathers all the essential data and phones it in to a website that the mine manager can view. It's very important these days with the public focus on the performance of industrial and mining operations. Um, each of those operations have consent and licence conditions that they have to meet and the Sentinex system enables them to manage their, their operations in a, in a way that uh, they can understand the potential impacts that they may have. 29 units are currently operating at mines in New South Wales and the company says the system can also be adapted for odour monitoring and security applications. Paul Lobb, NBN News. These mothers are giving their babies the best literary start to life by reading to them before they can talk. The earlier start, the more chance your child has of getting to love books at an early age. And that means that later on that they're going to find reading easier. The mums and their tiny bubs are taking part in a new program where infants aged between zero and two are taught to interact with books and toys at local libraries. The aim of the project is to develop their listening and memory skills as soon as possible and it uses more than just books to do it. It's really important to the children learn about the sounds of language as well and, that, and that's why we do a lot of rhymes. And the babies just seem to love it. 
After just one day, some parents are already sold on the program's educational benefits. He's only six months, but I think it's never too young to start and I think he's really enjoying it already and, yeah, he's learning each time. While others were more pleased about the opportunity for a bit of social interaction. They definitely get interested in, in, in the songs and seeing other children, even if they chew on the books. Madeline Bond, NBN News. It's no surprise the Knights were quick to secure McManus for the next three years. The promising 22-year-old played all 24 games during his debut year and, with 10 four-pointers, was the club's top try scorer. The winger's current contract doesn't run out until the end of this season, but McManus was keen to get the negotiations out of the way. I didn't want to go into the football season worrying about where I was going to be the next year and and uh, I love it here at Newcastle and I get along really well with all the coaches and all the players and, and uh, I was always going to stay, it was just uh, a case of getting the right deal. The former Darwin junior says he's already learned a great deal under coach Brian Smith and is looking forward to further developing his game with the possibility of making the transition to the centres. A year of first grade under my belt now and I think um, you know, I've got to really build on that and, and show that um, you know, I was, I was worth the club, you know, um, re-signing me again. Next on the Knights' list of re-signings is Cooper Vuna. The club has tabled a two-year deal to the winger who joined the side mid last year. Lauren Bladwell, NBN News. Hunter clubs have, in the past, hosted rounds of the New South Wales Premiership Series, a gathering of the state's best iron men and women. The four rounds are shared between branches, but local officials want to secure one every year. We've got the manpower and we can do it and we can run it with the officials the whole lot and they only really have to support that. They being Surf Life Saving New South Wales. The Hunter Branches push follows the Redhead Carnival last weekend where it offered cash prizes for open individual winners, the model it intends to use for a premiership round. If the four major branches can put prize money on like we proved um, on the weekend, the competitors will turn up. The idea needs support from the other big branches, Central Coast, Illawarra and Sydney, before the plan is taken to the state organisation. I think they should always always try and have an event up here. We've always got a strong contingent um, of competitors when we head to the Australian titles and state. I mean, their clubs up here do quite well overall on the point score. So, State officials say such events are the subject of expressions of interest from all seaside councils and that the Hunter plan could be met with opposition from country branches which may not want to travel long distances every year. For thousands of Japanese tourists who visit Port Stephens each year to go dolphin and whale watching are getting a little more attention from the locals than normal. Japanese visitors are, are, are collecting the, the fallout from uh, Australians uh, and others around the world that feel the same way as we do. 
Tour operators like Frank Future are trying to engage the visitors in conversation about their government's whaling program. Most Japanese people we meet never eat whale meat, know very little about it, but they're certainly finding out about it pretty quickly as they travel overseas. Teen whaling campaigner Sky Bortoli will travel to Tokyo in two weeks to personally present a 100,000 strong petition to Japan's opposition Democratic Party. She hopes with an election looming, the Japanese people will force change. Hopefully raise awareness in Japan. I mean, that, as I said, it's a key issue that you go over there and you tell these people what's actually happening so they can make an informed decision. They're absolutely not aware that whaling's occurring in, in Japan. They're not aware that their government's slaughtering whales. Paul Lobb, NBN News. This is the 9mm submachine gun police allege Solomon Sulai stashed in a bin outside Hamilton South Apartment Block. Police were conducting an operation targeting crime hotspots and repeat offenders along Hassel Street yesterday when they spotted Sulai carrying a bag. Subsequently he uh, ran away from the police and... Uh, uh, has indicated a, they observe him dump a uh, backpack. Um, they retrieved that backpack, I located the uh, firearm inside that. Officers then searched the area and quickly found the 30-year-old. Police say the discovery of the weapon and 25 rounds of ammunition is extremely worrying. I was quite alarmed by the fact that it was located um, where it's come from. We've still, still got some more inquiries to make, but it's very unusual to find a weapon of this nature on the streets. Sulai's appearance before Newcastle local court was delayed this morning after he required medical treatment for an infected cut. When he eventually faced court, he was refused bail and his case adjourned to the 6th of March. It's the second time in less than a week police have been called to Hassel Street for firearm-related crimes. Last Friday, a siege-like operation was carried out after police received reports of a man roaming the streets with a gun. Madeleine Bond, NBN News. Eric Manning is possibly the radar station's biggest fan. He came here with his mechanic brother during World War II and is now the driving force behind preserving the two bunkers. It was very important, this particular one, uh, because it showed the end of, really, the, the end of Australia's defence reliance on, on Britain. Covered in graffiti with smashed beer bottles scattered around, they're a long way from their former glory when important messages about bombing raids and sightings of enemy ships were relayed back to New Lambton and Williamtown in the 1940s. But Eric loves them still and can't understand why the state government is taking so long to add the concrete igloos to the Heritage Register. It's disappointing, yes, and unexplained, but uh, we're hopeful. With Catherine Hill Bay poised to go under the developer's hammer, he's sceptical about the delay. But Lake Macquarie MP Greg Piper says the radar station has its own merits. I don't believe that the uh, heritage values of the, uh, the radar station should, I would hope, um, be, impact, be impacted by proposals for development by either uh, Colin Allard or by the Rose Group. Eric's big wish is for the station to be fully restored. Penny Evans, NBN News. This isn't going to happen with people who are unknown, who are on independent panels, regardless of how good they are. They're not answerable to the public, and that's not right. The processionary caterpillar is an Australian native that can give people nasty rashes, but it is much more dangerous to pregnant horses. Research conducted in the Hunter and at the University of Queensland has found the caterpillar's hair penetrates the horse's stomach lining, allowing bacteria into the mare's bloodstream, which causes an infection that kills the foetus. Whether it causes an allergic reaction, we don't know. It, it's hard to say, and that's what we're trying to investigate. More than 30 abnormal abortions were recorded in 2004, most of them in the Hunter Valley. And while the industry was initially sceptical of the theory, several studs are now trying to eradicate the caterpillar from their grounds. The prevention that they're trying to do is to get rid of the nests in the trees by burning. 
and also prevent the mares from grazing under gum trees. Interestingly, the local breeding industry reported no caterpillar-related abortions this season, which has been linked to an increase in rainfall. And the rain has decreased that incidence. It's been quite a relief because they have been substantial number of losses. The researchers' next move is to test the theory on guinea pigs, but the long-term aim is to find ways of preventing the abortions, especially in the lucrative thoroughbred industry. Penny Evans, NBN News. As the old saying goes, no pain, no gain. Adam Griffiths joined brother Joel on the physio table this morning, one more confident than the other of facing the Mariners. It's okay, I think uh, I'm just having a couple of days rest just to make sure it uh, settles properly and then I'll get back into training probably, probably tomorrow. It feels a lot better today. Um, obviously we're going to have to wait and see. We've still got a couple of days to go before we'll make our decision. After injury crueled their chances of playing for the Socceroos, the Twins are desperate to lead the Jets into the grand final. Adam is more likely to be fit, but Joel says he's itching for game time to help rediscover his mid-season form. The coach says there will be no special treatment. Yeah, Saturday will definitely decide. I mean, if he hasn't uh, been able to train with the group till then, uh, then obviously he won't play. Uh, and Adam Griffiths is in the same boat. Adam offered little sympathy for his brother. I think if he... Uh gets off the, the, the table, he, he should be fine and uh, we'll, uh, we'll go out and beat Central Coast on the weekend. Van Egmond isn't phased by the Jets' record without Joel this season. Two games, two losses. Several players will be in contention if either brother is ruled out, but the Jets' attacking style won't change. Meanwhile, after watching Australia demolish Qatar, the Jets' own Socceroos are certain they can cope with the pressure of a World Cup qualifier. I felt probably a lot of the A-League players are hard done by as they couldn't really show they could compete with the European base as they didn't get back early. Mitchell Hughes, NBN News.
While we know how much money GPT plans to spend revitalising the eastern end of Hunter Street Mall, just what the company will build there remains a mystery. The final configuration really depends on the research and the community engagement that we'll do during the course of 2008. What we've been told to expect is a shopping and entertainment destination which will include department and discount department stores, leisure, tourist and residential areas. GPT CEO Nick Lyons today told the Hunters Property Council the project has moved into its initial planning stage with a development application expected to be lodged by the end of the year. A construction date has been set for 2009, completion sometime in 2011. Whether or not it will mean reopening the Hunter Mall is yet to be decided, but it's a move Newcastle City Council would more than likely welcome. Council has come to the point where we've almost endorsed it, but it's a project that requires a fair amount of money. Madeline Bond, NBN News. There's enough diversity and stability and underlying strength in the regional economy to move us comfortably into 2008. We're just lacking that really big spur that we need to, to increase, grow, increase growth to another level. It's basically eclipsed the Australian Surf Life Saving Championships as far as surf boat rails are concerned. So this is their, their biggest event of the year. In recent years, Graham Gilchrist became known for combining his love of art and boats to raise funds for cancer research, a disease which, ironically, he didn't know he had until a month before he died. But in his professional life as the first professor of fine arts at the University of Newcastle, Graham inspired a wave of young natural history illustrators. And it was Graham that actually brought the discipline of study to Newcastle. When he came back from Wales, he saw Newcastle as being a very good uh, location for this sort of work. An exhibition underway at the Newcastle Region Library's Lovett Gallery showcases 30 years of work by past and present students and has been dedicated to Graham Gilchrist. I think it's a wonderful tribute. Um, he would, would have been very proud of the work that's here today and um, I think an acknowledgement of the work that he did. The stunning exhibition runs until March the 22nd.
The death of 58-year-old John Bartlett, who'd been battling a blood cancer for 18 months, came as a heartbreaking shock to his family and friends. When I got the phone call, I uh, almost uh, fell off the lounge. I couldn't believe it happened so quickly. Today, they paid tribute to his strength of character. He never put down anybody. Everywhere I went with him, uh, he listened to people's uh, stories and what they need, and, uh, and he'd try and help them out. He was a really good bloke that way. I, I just think a true blue Aussie. But it's his public work as a state MP and mayor that most will remember him for. Over the past 25 years, he rallied on behalf of the Port Stephens tourism industry against spiralling public liability costs, which were making local events unviable. He campaigned against a methadone clinic in Mayfield and fought against bureaucratic red tape to get a GP in Karua. As a Port Stephens councillor, of many years as a mayor of Port Stephens and as a member of parliament John was a very dedicated person uh, and Port Stephens Shire will be uh, at a great loss to lose a man of his calibre. He will be a loss, he, he was a great fellow and uh, he will be sorely missed. John's pride in his work and love of his community never faltered and that was evident when he announced his retirement as member for Port Stephens in 2006. If people can look back on my time and say well I came here in 1962 with my father and he said, I bought you to paradise. Well, look at it. We haven't done too badly. Madeline Bond, NBN News. If the weather didn't keep swimmers away, the thought of sharks did. But an aerial sweep would give competitors the all clear on a miserable Lake Macquarie morning. 183 people started the 3.8 kilometre dash from Coal Point to Belmont. The whitewash, a mishmash of experience and youth to begin with, but it was the latter to break away. Up front, 17-year-old Jared Killey had an escort in the middle before crossing in 41 minutes 39 seconds to win back-to-back -back titles. Maybe I'll make it through next year. In the women's, 14-year-old Kirsty Wall won the event from long-distance champion Shelley Clark. Pretty tough race, we were together pretty much the whole way, so it was pretty hard. Bondi's Cyril Baldock agrees, and this from a man who once crossed the English Channel. Uh, this is a lot shorter, but it was a pretty tough swim. It's uh, you now got fairly choppy out there, it's been the wind's coming from the south and southwest, and it's a uh, yeah, fairly hard swim. While she still might be unpacking, Assistant Commissioner Lee Shearer has already identified what issues need resolving across the Northern Region Command. The bigger issues of course are always going to be resource issues for us. That's clearly something that needs my early attention. Ms Shearer plans to stand by the controversial idea of mobile policing in some areas, which she says results in quicker police response times, but it also means some stations will remain unmanned. Our philosophy is all about making sure p police are out in the community and servicing the community needs. It's a bit of a dilemma because some communities say, well, we want our police stations open, so it's, it's bridging that gap. Since leaving her post as Newcastle's local area commander in 2005, Ms Shearer has worked in Sydney heading police legal services, but she says her decision to return to the city was easy. Whilst I am a lawyer, my desire was really to get back to the front line. Madeline Bond, NBN News.
Instead of shying away from today's wet weather, around 500 children in Newcastle chose to embrace it. They cycled, ran and swam their way through the city's leg of the Wheat Bix Kids Triathlon. Well, I thought it was pretty good and I like swimming and I like the running and the bicycle ride. It's just really fun and it's good to try something new every now and then. The non-competitive event promotes a healthy and active lifestyle and aims to involve 40,000 children across Australia and New Zealand by the end of the year. You want to be fit and active and healthy when you're growing up and you know a day like today is a perfect example of how you know kids can come out and have a try at something and, and just give it a go. Madeline Bond, NBN News. These titles were a way to mark Stockton Surf Club's 100th anniversary, but that's where the local celebration stopped. Hunter crews were left to watch on and what a show in the reserve men's final, despite the relatively tame conditions. Wanda was made to work for the win in what would be a great carnival for Sydney clubs. It was worth the trip as well for Victorian crews as the women from Phillip Island won the under-23 decider, edging out reigning champion McMaster's Beach. Dixon Park's new boat made an appearance in the under-19 men's final, crewed by Noosa Heads, which finished with silver, behind Torquay. In the open women's Ocean Thunder National Series leader, South Curl Curl, showed its strength, winning by two lengths. It's a great indication of the speed that you're on and how you're going to go and if you really need to do any work. So we're pretty happy with, with how we went and we think we've got you know, a little bit more in us. The Evoca Beach Open men's crew hasn't lost a race this year and started the final as favourite, holding out Coogee to win the gold, a boost heading into state and Aussie campaigns. The Australians are the one we want. We'll give it all away for that. We just want it bad. Just keeps us motivated. Oh, it's going to be a tough weekend, but yeah, I pulled it through. It was a bit of a struggle coming in, but I'm not very good at catching waves. 